I went into medicine because I wanted to be a healer. And I believe that those of us practicing medicine were there to fight against the germs, the toxins, the cancers, the injuries that plague mankind. And I went into the Navy because I really was patriotic and because I really liked that uniform. And the Navy, in its wisdom, allowed me to practice tropical and emerging diseases and sent me to all kinds of interesting places in the world. And one of those is in this image here, which was taken in 1993. And in these places, I practiced not only for the troops, but also for many underprivileged people. In 1993, I'd been practicing medicine for 11 years, and that was my last year of innocence. Because I was soon called into the State Department and informed that infectious diseases had become a national security issue. And the next thing I knew, I went to uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds and Fort Detrick and the Armed Forces Radiobiology Institute and War College. And the next thing I knew, I was a UN weapons inspector and learning all about how chemicals and biological agents and radiation were used deliberately against other people. And you know, the very first effective modern chemical agent was used in Ypres on April 22nd of 1915, and it was chlorine gas and the front lines released against the, um, the British and French troops there. And these people choked because this was a choking agent. It was very nasty. It affected their entire respiratory system. They could hardly breathe, and it opened up a whole new can of worms. Soon enough, there were all kinds of other chemical agents being used. They decided to try to use phosgene, and phosgene turns into hydrochloric acid in your lungs, kind of melting them away. And that was very nasty. But the war continued, and towards the end of the war, the Germans were running out of supplies, they were desperate to end the war, and everybody had come up with gas masks so that these agents that you get by inhalation were no longer that effective. So they said, well, let's try something else. Let's try something that works despite the gas masks. And they tried sulfur mustard. And sulfur mustard attacks you through your skin, and you get internal and external blisters. You get blisters on your horrible blisters, on your mouth, your nose, your skin, your eyes. And many, many, many people went blind. In fact, this agent, this sulfur mustard, that was used towards the very end of the war was so effective that, remember, the British were among the very first who were exposed to an effective chemical agent. Sulfur, 1917, caused 88% of British casualties. And even among the survivors, they would spend 42 days or more in hospital. And you'd think that we would stop using something this nasty, but instead, oh, it was effective. So we actually modified it in different ways, and it kept being used in wars and in conflicts. Now, I'm talking about a really nasty thing. And yet, even back in World War I, there was a hint of something else. And this hint is that there were anecdotal reports that among French farmers, there were cures of cancer among those exposed to sulfur mustard. And even autopsies showed that maybe this had some effect. So, the Army, in its wisdom, called James Ewing down from Cornell University to the Army Medical Museum, and he started reviewing this, and he said, well, there might be something to this. And the next thing you know, the Army and the Navy started pouring money into this kind of research and discovered that some of these agents, and in particular, when you take the sulfur out and make it nitrogen mustard, did, and they were doing this as classified studies, did in fact work as chemotherapeutic agents. So they declassified this 21 years after it was first used in war, in April 1946, and renamed it methchlorethamine, which is still nitrogen mustard, but a less scary name. And from there, we were able to derive a whole bunch of other chemotherapeutic agents that work not only against 
uh, testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, but Hodgkin's disease, lymphomas, uh, autoimmune diseases. And in fact, one of these, cyclophosphamide, uh, was part of the cocktail that rescued Daniel, the, the, the dear son of a dearest friend of mine. Now, what are we looking at here? Looks like a mat of ugly hair, something you want to wipe off your counter quickly, clean it out. Well, actually, what this is, is a photo I took of a culture that was cultured out of the nose of one of the people exposed at the heart building, the Senate building, during the anthrax letters. And in higher magnification, what you see there very clearly are those very rapidly going, growing anthrax bacteria. And as you remember, these letters were sent through the U.S. Postal Service and affected a lot of postal workers, and they were sent to media people as well as to... Uh, uh, Senate and congressmen, and those people who inhaled this bacteria, the spores, and who would, did not get prompt treatment developed inhalational anthrax, which is an extremely horrific disease, as we all know. In fact, inhalational anthrax, about 50% of the time, uh, produces a hemorrhagic meningitis, a bloody brain is what you're looking at here. Now, what good could come of this? What good could come of anthrax? Well, it so happens that bacterial toxins, because it is the toxins that cause the disease, target very specific parts of cells and affect very specific, specific proteins within cells. And as they do that, we can direct it so that now we're able to apply bacterial toxins, like anthrax toxins, towards the cure of cancers, towards making better vaccines against HIV, um, and other nasty bacteria like salmonella and cholera bacteria have also been adapted in the same way for use to to make better vaccines, better uh, protection against autoimmune diseases, and against cancers. We were on the brink of war very recently. Why? Because a chemical agent was used in Syria. A nerve agent, sarin. Sarin, we all know, is extremely deadly. How does it work? Well, allow me to remind you. <laughs> Pretend that that blob on the top is, the, is a nerve ending, and that this is a junction between a nerve and a muscle or a gland. And that little flash of blue there is an electric charge. And as the electric charge goes down that nerve, it stimulates those little bubbles there that are supposed to be like spaceships with a payload to go down to the edge of the nerve, dock, and release their payload of what here are they're neurotransmitters, but we'll call them little green dots. And little green dots go down to the receptor on the muscle, and the muscle contracts. Or if it's a gland, the, muscle, the gland releases its fluid, whatever type of gland it is. Of course, once it's done that, you want to turn it off. And there is an enzyme that, uh, acetylcholinesterase, that's a membrane-bound enzyme that then chews up the little green dots, like a Pac-Man. Actually, it was my friend James Madsen, who likes to call himself the Mad Duck, that came up with calling them little Pac-Men, because it's much easier to understand. So the little Pac-Men eat up the little green dots, and you turn off the system, and you go back to normal. But if there is a chemical nerve agent around, like sarin, what happens is it essentially gets in the mouth of the Pac-Man, and it can't eat up the little green dots. So there's too many little green dots. So you're muscle keeps contracting and the glands keep secreting and soon enough you go into convulsions and you go into contractions and you're, you can't breathe and your heart rate changes and in minutes you're dead if you don't get an antidote and you're not treated. It's nasty. And there are other agents that affect at the same junction, some that block the receptor and you're kind of paralyzed. And there's one in particular set of toxins they're not exactly nerve agents, but they're neurotoxic agents that we called, that the bioweaponeers called Agent X. Agent X. Agent X, what it does is it doesn't allow the spaceships to dock and release their little green dots. And it stays there for months. So you can imagine that if those little green dots are not able to go down, Okay, you're paralyzed. 
you can't breathe, and you can die. And this is extremely powerful, this Agent X. In fact, so powerful that all kinds of countries, when they had offensive biowarfare programs, weaponized this particular agent. We began weaponizing it in the United States in the 1940s. We thought the Germans might use it, and we tried to prepare antidote for D-Day. We know that the Soviets tested it in Rebirth Island. This is a nasty agent. And it affects you differently whether you get it by inhalation, by injection, or by eating it. And when you eat this particular Agent X, it might take 24 hours to do its thing. So back in the, during World War I, when we had the Office of Strategic Studies, which was the precursor to the CIA, they developed these little gelatin tablets that are smaller than the head of your common pin that they would give to Chinese prostitutes to put behind their ear so one little drop into the glass of a Japanese officer would do him in by the next day in a clandestine way. Agent X is so toxic that I want to compare it to sarin. Sarin will kill 50% of people that are exposed to 100 micrograms per kilogram. What does that mean? Well, 100 micrograms per kilogram is about 1 500th of a teaspoon. Try measuring that in your kitchen. So 50% of people exposed to 1 500th per kilogram of, of a teaspoon of sarin will be dead without treatment. What about Agent X? 100,000 times more powerful, depending on how it gets into your body, than sarin. So if it takes a dinosaur's worth of sarin, it would take about a flea's worth of the Agent X to kill you. Who here would like to volunteer for a little Agent X? No? No takers? Are you sure? Because you see, it turns out Agent X was, I said, the code name used by our bioweaponeers for botulinum toxin. And you know it as Botox. <laughs> Botox was first used uh, medic medicinally to help uh, little children with, uh, and adults who had problems with their eye muscles, cross-eyed. And it was because it, 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 you know, of that use for the uh, eye muscles that ophthalmologists noticed that it was uh, pretty good at getting rid of wrinkles, and uh, we all know what happened after that. There's now millions of people that use Botox cosmetically, and now we know of almost a hundred different applications for that wonderful drug. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that if we understand the chemistry, the biology, the physiology, the physics of an agent, and if we give the right amount at the right time, in the right place, at the right way, we can do good instead of bad. And it's all about intent. It's all about intent. And those of us who have been, are, or even just trained to be uh, weapons inspectors know this issue. This issue is the issue of dual use. Dual use is the fact that we can use these things for good or for bad. And the fact that that's the case allows us to create the kinds of self-monitoring that we need and that we've developed so that um, there now exist laws that are national and laws that are international and ways in which we monitor what people are doing. So that if I go as a weapon inspector and into your lab and you're working with anthrax, I don't automatically assume you're weaponizing it because you might be coming up with the next best cure for cancer. And what I want you to reimagine as possible is that we as a, as a species can focus on those good uses for the things that exist in our world, and that then I can then focus on going back to being me against the germs, against the toxins, against the cancers, and practice real medicine. And I thank you for your attention.